Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so very much for you being our God, the one who created everything, the one who hung the stars in the sky, the one who gave us new life, new birth. I just ask your continued blessings as we move on through Colossians verse by verse. I ask your your blessing upon all those who have taken the time to study through this epistle with us. I ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I'd like to begin uh, this study here in Colossians uh, with a scripture reading from John 15, uh, beginning at verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're back to studying together in the Epistle to the Colossians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were around somewhere around verse 17, I believe, of chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Now, as we study what God has done for us in Christ, it's my hope that, that we have our eyes opened to the depths of this passage. Folks, I'm fully aware of the, of the inability that I have to express fully and totally what we're looking at here. In a previous video, we saw that the Creator of heaven and earth, the very God who spoke it into existence, is our God. He's head of the church. He's head of the body. In the 16th verse, we see that all things, all things, were created by Him and for Him. And I believe that to include the new creation, our being born from above. That new nature was not created by something that we did. We see in the 17th verse that He is before, that is the word in the Greek is pro, in front of, earlier than, all things, and in, your authorized version should say by Him, uh, it's actually in, Epsilon Nu, in Him all things consist, or all things hold together. A, uh, another reference to the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see in the 18th verse that we're part of Him. We saw in Ephesians, if you followed us through that study, that we were actually taken out of Christ. In Matthew, that uh, we were sown by God, that the Creator of heaven and earth is our God. We belong to Him. We have the testimony of the Word of God that He knows our frame, that it's but dust, that He deals with us as sons, that He knows the way that we take, and when He's tested us, we shall come forth as gold, that He's branded our names on the palms of His hands, that He lights our candle, that He bottles our tears. We also know that He will never leave us nor forsake us, the majestic God of all creation is our God, and we rejoice in the truth of the 18th verse. More than that, we find that the head of the body, the church, Jesus Christ, might have, might have the preeminence. The word there means, in the, in the original text, the word means be first. And it is in the subjunctive mood. I've had to differ with one of my other pastor friends on this where he, 
he's failed to to actually recognize or he's unwilling to admit the fact uh, that the grammar clearly states that it is the uh, subjunctive it's in the mood of uncertainty now many of you who have followed along with these videos uh, You've probably heard me talk about the indicative mood and the subjunctive mood. The indicative mood is the mood of certainty. The subjunctive mood is the mood of uncertainty. Now, to confirm this, I've created a screenshot showing the indicative mood of certainty twice associated with the word is and the subjunctive mood of uncertainty associated with the word might be. You know, maybe he will be first. Maybe he won't. Now, we know that objectively, he, he is preeminent. But subjectively, he may or may not be preeminent, that is, first. He might not come first. He might not be placed ahead of self. Revelation 2.4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Look at the text, folks. What it is saying is, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might be first. And you are faced with the almost certain reality that those not putting Christ first will become bewildered when you dare suggest that they have elevated man above Christ. In the 19th verse, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now, you'll note in the authorized version that the words the Father are in italics. They're not there. The translators have chosen to put in the Father, and I don't have any objection to that, that in the Lord Jesus Christ all the fullness dwells. And men have wrestled with this concept down through the centuries and yet today there seems to be this sort of a sneaky insidious idea among Christians who've not studied this in much detail that the Lord Jesus Christ well he used to be God and somehow emptied himself of his deity and and now less than God became incarnate in the flesh and died in everybody's place where the, those who reject him and wind up in hell, wind up paying for sins that Christ himself paid for, which would be an unjust act on the part of God, what we call double jeopardy. He died in our place. His death for us was substitutionary, not provisional. God Almighty in the person of Jesus Christ died in your place. He was and is God, a very God. He's not something less than God. That simply won't stand the test of Scripture. His humiliation was the display of His glory, not the emptying of His divine attributes. Now, it is implicitly clear in the Word of God that He was not always incarnate. He was always man. The Son of Man came down from heaven. Let us make man in our own image. He was always man. But he was not always incarnate. Now he was pre-incarnate because he appeared to, you know, in that pre-incarnate form to at least Adam and Moses. But he was not always incarnate. In order to become our kinsman redeemer, God Almighty became incarnate in human flesh without ceasing to be deity. He emptied himself of the display of his glory and he died on the cross in our place. What we are now being asked to see in the text is the permanency of that union. We had in the incarnation the union of God and man, a union that has staggered the understanding of humans down through the centuries. that that union is a permanent union. The incarnation does not, did not, will not cease to exist. What we see in the, in the, the uh, 13th verse, 
is the absolute likeness of the invisible God. We have the incarnate Christ with all of the fullness permanently at home in Him. And we'll see it re-emphasized in the second chapter, uh, verse 9. For in Him dwelleth all of the fullness of deity bodily. The text is telling us that Christ did not go back to heaven as God where we no longer have Christ incarnate. The text tells us that the incarnate Christ is now permanent and that in Him dwells all the fullness permanently. It is settled down and, and it's at home. And so we see the continuous, the permanent continuance of the incarnate Christ. And that's why I've suggested to you in, in previous studies that when we get to glory, we're not going to meet God the Father, God the, 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 the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We're going to meet God dwelling totally and absolutely in the incarnation, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a God-man sitting on the throne, folks. Now, And if that doesn't excite you, nothing will. Further, we see in the 19th verse that this pleased the Father. It pleased Him. It was God's will. Why did God create? Why did, did He accomplish what He did? What did He, did he accomplish in, in creating everything? I mean, what has been His plan? The text tells us that the central theme of all of the plan of God is the incarnate Christ. I'm convinced that if we were able to, to, to look across the fog bank of all of human history, the one thing that would rise through the fog is the cross of Christ and His resurrection from the dead. Our majestic, almighty God determined the incarnation, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ before the first Adam was ever spoken into existence. I Adam, A T O M, not A D A M. Before there was any creation, God had determined it all. I think we also have to see in the verse that there was no other course of operation for God. There could have been no other way that He could have accomplished what He did. He determined to show His wrath against sin, and that's done. He determined to show His wisdom. He determined to show His mercy. And He determined to show His grace. It was absolutely mandatory that it be done in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the pleasure of the Father that we are looking at here. But don't pass that concept without the realization that the pleasure of the Father includes you. You know, I... Horses might be my great concern, or you know, animals. You know, my love for for horses, your love for for dogs or cats, or you know, or or it could go beyond that to, you know, you know, you want world peace, okay? I mean, you know, you're think of all of our concerns: world peace, international, uh, international. I, I don't know. Without getting into another subject, I don't know how you can be a Christian today and, and be so disturbed by uh, prophetic events uh, for the, God setting the stage for the end time events. But, you know, if you want world peace, if you're concerned about inflation, starvation, no matter what, you know, just put, you know, a, 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 any modern need there, you know, in a, in a, plan that spans from creation when everything was spoken into existence to the, the new heavens and new earth. It was the pleasure of the Father that Christ be the head of the body of the church and that Christ Jesus would be first. Folks, first. First in our minds. First in our lives. First in our walk, our message, our ministry. First in our conversation first in our life.
God willed first. He spoke to us first. He acted first. He blessed us first. And yet today, today, we are surrounded by a world religious system that has placed itself before Him where that it's first. Now let's go on to the 20th verse. I'd like to present, you know, this a little in a little bit closer to what the Greek says. It pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell, and it pleased the Father to reconcile you unto himself having made peace through the blood of his cross. That's what the text says. The authorized version says, having made peace by the blood of his cross to reconcile you. That's what the text says. But it pleased the Father to reconcile you, having already made peace through the blood of the cross. Looking at the text then, and, and having made peace by means of the blood of the cross, the, the word make peace is a combination of two Greek words to create peace, to create a union, aorist participle, meaning that God is not doing this, that God is not in the process of completing this, but that God has done this once and for all. And we're looking at the fact that it's done. And we have wrapped up in one word all of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know from Philippians that He humbled Himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It was the cross that brought the curse on Christ. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I see in the text that there is no other way God could have done what He did other than through the death of His Son. It's the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that we're looking at here that was given for us that we might have life and have it more abundantly. We see in the cross that God has created a bond between us and Himself. And there are three main words used by the Holy Spirit from the standpoint of sin, we see three words, justification, propitiation, and reconciliation. And I've read articles where, that, uh, where they talked about how God was reconciled. Folks, God didn't, never needed to be reconciled. You needed to be reconciled. I needed to be reconciled interesting aspect of the word reconciliation is to return to a former state. I want you to not, don't miss this, folks. That's a concept that many have detested with an intense anger. You read in Peter that they re return unto the shepherd and bishop of their souls, and there are those who wish with all their hearts that, that it wasn't returned. The word isn't returned, but it is. We were always His, estranged by sin, but God brought us back. That is, that's absolutely implicit in the word reconciliation. It means to restore to a former position. Okay? And that was, obviously, that was never required of God. You know, God doesn't change. It's all, only necessary of you and me. When you enter your Bible school or, or, or seminary training, early in the course you'll learn that reconciliation is the manward aspect of, of the person in the work of Christ. That propitiation is the Godward aspect of the person in the work of Christ. And that justification, righteousness, is the sinward aspect of the person in the work of Christ. But folks, God brought us back. It means to restore to a former position. That's what the word means. And you can't change it. We have returned. We have, without a doubt, we've returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. Why? Because we were his. We were always his. 
Reconciliation, folks, already implies that we belonged to God. Every plant which my Father has not planted shall be rooted up. There's the joy, the rejoicing that wells up in the heart with the realization that I was His before time began. I was in the plan and the purpose and the program of God. Not because I made some decision, not because I did something or was born someplace, but because God planted me. And then God, through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, created a permanent bond which can't be broken. I've returned to the bishop and the shepherd of my soul, having made peace by means of the blood of His cross. We establish the law in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the union created by the blood of His cross. We can't help but see the seriousness of sin. We can't help but see the magnitude of the price paid by Christ that we might be reconciled to Him. We saw in Romans, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Christ was cursed so that I might have life. How should I then live? Should I then walk day after day with no consideration of that love, that grace, that mercy that was shown in the sacrifice of Christ in my place? Should I put myself first before Christ? I see men getting together in, in great theological debates trying to decide whether or not God is dead as if their decision determines the truth. I hear people say, you know, you've got to make Christ Lord of your life. Well, he, folks, He is. You couldn't make Him that if you wanted to. And you couldn't stop Him from being that if you wanted to. Christ is Lord. Whether you see Him as Lord or not. So I see what it costs God that I might be reconciled. I see in the 20th verse, He reconciled all things to Himself, things in earth and things in the heavens, plural, says the Greek. I mean, I can understand Him reconciling me, but you know. You know, look, we saw back, I believe in the, in the 18th verse, 16th verse, He created all things. All creation was under the curse. It needed to be restored to a former condition. Creation itself needed to be reconciled. Now I want you to think of that the next time you hear the song, There's Power in the Blood. And all of that was accomplished in the blood of His cross. And it is not you and me who benefited from the reconciliation of creation, but creation which benefited from our reconciliation. You were also a participant in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. When He was raised, you were raised with Him. Think about it, okay? That the real program of the reconciliation of all creation was centered in you and me. We were the central purpose. It pleased the Father to reconcile you by means of the blood of His cross. Somehow I want you to see that, that it, it was not by means of your acceptance, your repentance, your baptism, your commitment, your love, your dedication, your devotion, your belief, but by the blood of His cross. I want you to see that if we are to add any human synergism there, then we by that much reduce the blood of the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we would in fact reduce the cross of Christ to zero because we would be emphasizing the human aspect of this reconciliation. I want to suggest to you that the text eliminates any human synergism. Verse 21, estranged from God in our minds only. 
Okay? That reveals a startling fact. We were always his. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.